I'm really excited to be here. Uh, this is quite an honor. Um, I want to thank Barbara for inviting me out here and my, uh, my family for supporting me. My mom who's here, who's probably going to make me more nervous than anyone. Um, <laughs> but um, it's really great to be able to do this. And uh, I've got a ton of slides. I'm going to try to get through quickly some of the uh, earlier work that I think is important because it does provide a kind of context. And I think you'll see over time how I landed up where I am at this point in time, uh, which is a very different place than I probably imagined uh, years ago when I started doing this. Um, as a way to get started, a horrible slide, and there's a reason I only have this slide, uh, but uh, we can really go into it. But I've been working with uh, computing and kind of digital technology uh, as, as a student first off and as professionally ever since 1990. Uh, but I, I fell into a very unique program at San Jose State University in 1983, the Cadre Institute. It was one of the first kind of media-based programs in the California State University system. I was studying graphic design at the time. And one of my design professors said, it's all going digital. You have to take a computer class if you want to be a designer. I hated computers. I had no interest whatsoever. And took this class and found it was something quite different. Um, and as an example, this is the first, really sort of first project I ever did on a computer. And this is a interactive computerized confessional done on an Apple IIe computer. And so basically, you knelt down at the computer, went through the process of Catholic confession, and were absolved of your sins. And this was uh, before ATM machines, before the digitization of just about everything in our lives, and, and was really sort of a, a jumping off from uh, Joseph Weizenbaum's uh, famous project, ELISA, uh, done at MIT. But just to give you some context, because it does, it does sort of frame, I think, what has been an interest in my work from, from here on out, really, is kind of an exploration of content through new technologies, exploring social issues, politics, humor, um, and this kind of virtualization of real experience. And what does it all mean? And how do you how do you react to it? What do you do about that as an artist? Um, this next piece is uh, a leap forward, pretty significant installation project uh, that I created in 1996, 97. It's called Masturbatory Interactive, and it's a um, it's my take on Marcel Duchamp's The Large Glass, The Bride Stripped Bare by Her Bachelor's Even. And I made a working version of his chocolate grinder, which is an interactive work that interacts with itself. Um, basically, the, the drums on the uh, chocolate grinder are covered with laser barcodes, and there's a laser barcode scanner uh, that you'll see in a moment here that it, it goes in and out from the inside of this machine, randomly scanning barcodes. Um, when it scans a barcode, it sends a signal to the computer CPU to then project imagery upon the second part of the installation, which is My Bride, uh, which is a, a female party sex doll painted white inside of a uh, vinyl enclosure being blown by fans. Um, and it's just this kind of cyclical kind of uh, installation that is about sort of sexual frustration and this kind of mass masturbating interactive process, uh, really kind of questioning the nature of interactivity at its base. Um, but it's a reenactment of sorts as well, of, of a very famous work from art history, as I'm sure uh, you all know. Um, I went on from there to uh, explore further similar issues, but kind of delving into interactive processes through computer mice. and. Uh, Running computer labs, I work at a university, University of Nevada, Reno, and running computer labs really for the last 20 years or so, you go through a lot of technology. Um, and being the recycler that I am, uh, was really sort of holding on to and hoarding these uh, computer mice as they died as I went through this process of life in our lab. So I started reconfiguring them. Uh, the image on the top left is a vagina mouse. It's an actual mouse that has been uh, sculpted, shown with this obviously phallic jo joystick, which is where I got the idea from, it's like we have these joysticks involved in computer gaming that are so phallic, it needed a partner, a heterosexual partner. Um, so that's where it came from. Uh, the one on the bottom left is the Unabomber's mouse, which is a dead computer mouse with the first two sentences from Ted Kaczynski's 
um, manifesto burned into the surface of the mouse using a votive candle and little punches that you would use from metal. And the one on the right is my heart mouse. And again, it, this is an actual model. This is not a, a photoshopped image. Um, and this one I actually gave to my college roommate after he married the woman that he met on the internet. And they have it hanging in their house, which is quite nice. Um, other early projects, and this is, again, coming out of uh, grad school in the Silicon Valley where there are these amazing stores full of the detritus of the computer industry. And so these are kind of leftovers I would, I would buy at these kind of thrift stores of technology. Um, mice, mouse balls, you know, the tracking balls that used to be inside of mice before they became fully electronic. Um, but this is really probably the most important piece to come out of this the, the, what I call the mouse series. Um, this is my artist mouse. This is a functioning computer mouse. And uh, on the right, you see several iterations of this project. And for several years now, actually, uh, I'm still working with this project. Uh, I created this in thinking about what what is a mouse? What is a computer mouse? And this is, in a way, sort of reverse engineering. You know, mouse is kind of uh, advancement on the pencil, in a way or a pointer or these various, you know, tools. So this was a way of kind of bringing the reality of what this is back to it and kind of taking the technology backwards. But when I invented this, it was kind of like, wow, what am I going to do with this? And the first idea that came about, this was my first foray into using computer games in my work. I had been exposed to these games largely through my students and through the process of ordering equipment for our labs this is before the Apple Store and all that. You would order things from Mac Mall and these various magazines, and they would oftentimes send you your technology and, a, and then a free disc that would usually be a computer game. And, and Marathon, various games like this, and there was often they were a bit like pushers, you know, trying to get you kind of interested in this stuff. And so I started playing these games, really got kind of obsessed with them and really intrigued, you know, having come through this era of discussion about virtual reality and the, the invention of these new technologies, these immersive spaces that we would all be enjoying and living in and being free. And the, the result, the, the most popular result is this, is these kind of games where you basically run around shooting things. And fascinating. This, this is a game called Unreal. Um, and this was the first game that I engaged on an artistic level. Uh, these are mouse drawings done with the, the artist mouse uh, from this called Playing Unreal. And yeah, I did basically replace my mouse pad with a, a piece of very of uh, rag paper, fine art rag paper, and played for about an hour each, replacing my mouse. And it's they were these amazing little hairball drawings, these little abstract, uh, literal mappings of of an entire hour of computer gameplay. Um, I went on to do a number of experiments with this artist mouse uh, from on the left that is doing my taxes uh, from 2001 and going through Quicken uh, tax program, whatever it was called at the time. And when the balance went in the black, it was black. When it went in the red, it was red. And this was a scroll that was laid out on my desk as I did my taxes. Uh, top right is a, uh, that's part of a series of works called Blind Internet Museum Paintings. And each of these is it's a it's it's a oil on canvas. Each is a visit to a famous art museum, and going through their website, the color scheme of the website defined the use of the colors from the background to the foreground. So the one on the second from the right is actually a visit to MoMA's website at the time, which was primarily black, white, and red. Um, and at the bottom, I would write the name of the museum and sign it for the date. So again, it's a literal tracking of going through pretty much the entire website, so the Whitney, MoMA, uh, that, that type of thing. Bottom right is uh, playing chess against the computer, each of those uh, done with a Sumi ink brush and ink. And uh, about seven games each, and I lost all the games because I don't play chess very well. But uh, there's a bit of an homage there as well to Marcel Duchamp and his obsession and love for chess later in his life. Um, Ma further mouse drawings that I'm still engaged in. Uh, these are the top ones are each done in about a 32 inch square piece of paper. They each represent roughly a month of all of my computer time. So I put these on my desk and kind of rotate them and I'd be playing games, writing memos. I wrote a paper for CAA in New York, I think in 98, 99, I can't remember which year. 
Um, the one on the bottom left was done, uh, it was department chair at the University of Nevada, Reno. And this is about, I think it's about four months of all of my time at the desk doing the chair's job, which is a really boring job. Um, but it's, it's again, it's this literal mapping of the time spent writing memos, answering emails, you know, uh, doing evaluations. Um, so it's, it's this kind of durational uh, mapping of time and work um, that is, has become even more so important in my work. Um, one last mouse project, which is ongoing. Uh, this is my mouse mandala, which I started in 1998, and I hope to finish this someday. It's, it's, I want to make a huge room size weaving of dead computer mice. And I would buy these boxes of dead mice at these stores down in Silicon Valley for you know like pennies on the dollar. I get a box of like a hundred mice for about twenty bucks, and just I have boxes and boxes of these, and I, I will be putting this together. But it is that same kind of cyclical, uh, uh, kind of spiral shape. A um, lot of circles in my work uh, that uh, that I think you will see. But this is all woven together by hand. There's no there's no trickery to this, and there part of this work as well is a kind of. Um, Rai dedication to the uh, the Luddites of the 19th century in England, uh, weavers and craftspersons who were put out of work and who actually revolted against the Industrial Revolution, the largest mobilization of British troops in their history against their own citizens. Um, so this is kind of, you can think of, I'm fascinated by these mice, each of them having a literal track record, each of them having traveled miles across a desktop, most likely in the cubicle culture of Silicon Valley. And so there are these like documents of carpal tunnel syndrome, of time, of work, and then they're discarded. But they each have this history of, of, of going uh, hundreds of miles uh, on various desktops as these icons of work, a uh, new type of work. And a little Buddha, Buddha ball guy, that's a Buddha statue from Cos Plus covered with the mouse balls from these dead computer mice. Um, how I became a performance artist in computer games. It's really an experiment. Um, soon after about the, the first uh, experiment with Unreal, these shooter games began to uh, merge onto the internet as first person shooter environments where you would engage, usually on a team of you know anywhere from five to 12 players against five to 12 other players and all connected via the internet and running around these virtual environments shooting each other. And whoever kills the most uh, opponents wins. Um, these spaces fascinated me. Again, this sort of connection to the kind of uh, hyperbole surrounding the emergence of virtual reality and the belief in these kind of spaces. And when you go into these, these environments, I began to look at them as theatrical environments because they're very much like a, a Broadway stage set in the sense that there's these implications of more space beyond. There's always these doors you come through that don't open, but they imply that there is space, and oftentimes there would be images at the horizon that would give you this sense that there was more there, but they're very, very, generally very small. Um, and so I started thinking about these as theater spaces and, and the notion of being able to utilize this space for purposes other than this virtual mayhem intrigued me. So I created this first experiment in online performance uh, for myself where I went into uh, Star Trek Elite Force Voyager online, a very popular shooter game at the time, as Allen Ginsberg, and rather than playing the game, I typed in using the text messaging system, uh, howl verbatim, word for word. Uh, and this took about six hours. Um, sitting at my computer, I was projecting it in my studio. And fascinating because you're constantly being killed, then you're reincarnated, you come back, killed, reincarnated, come back. And so it's this very, again, that sort of circular, cyclical kind of process of, of performing death, reincarnation, rebirth. Um, and very intense, really silly. Gamers were replying, wow, poetry and shooting. Wow, this is, you know, and, and kind of reacting, uh, not sure how to react to it uh, uh, from what I could tell. But it was also this kind of republishing, this sort of, okay, you think about all the kids playing these games all the time, they're not reading books. And we see that. If you teach at a university or at a high school or whatever, you see how little students read these days. And they're usually doing this. And so it's like, 
a way of sort of bringing it to them. It's just kind of a public service in a way, um, in my mind. So um, I went on from there uh, to kind of up the ante a little bit. Um, this is a um, this was really crazy. Uh, I, I did several other a couple other pieces as a solo artist in this space, and I start to think about. When you get into these games, you start noticing that people are members of clans, these sort of gaming clans, and they, they'll either have their own server or they'll go to, to other servers en masse as like a team to kind of beat other players. So I formed a temporary performance troupe, myself and five of my students uh, who were all gamers, and we went into a very popular game at the time, Quake Arena, each in character from the TV show Friends, and we performed an episode of Friends full length. Um, and this was just, this was like a revelation. This, the, 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 the sound, the, the, the image, the heads exploding. This, this was a really controversial game. This was the most bloody, most violent computer game that had come out to date and very popular. Um, so we did the first one in our computer lab at the university and I decided to restage it again. But that, that was almost like a test, the first one. And so we set up to do this in our shepherd gallery at the university. And, uh, very nicely, a uh, writer from the New York Times, Matt Mirapal, who used to be the uh, Arts Online writer, wrote a story about it. And I um, was really excited about it. Uh, he heard about the work through uh, Rhizome. And of course, as soon as the, this got out there, the next day I get a phone call from an attorney from Warner Brothers Television and saying, you know, uh, cease and desist. We don't want you performing you know, our copyrighted material. I remove all friends, reference images from your website. Et cetera, et cetera, don't do this. So I go to the University Council at the University of Nevada and I'm, I'm saying, so what, what, do you, what do you guys think? And of course they panic and they're like, do everything they say, take it all down. And, and I'm like, I, you know, I research a little bit. I come from, uh, my mother's a lawyer. I'm not, you know, I do have some sense of your, your rights as an artist. And so I researched a little bit. I went back to him, I said, no, this is fair use. You know, this is, this is definitely, um, this is definitely a, a, a satirical uh, effort and I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I can't in, in any good conscience follow what you were saying. And in our conversation, the attorney was actually fairly nice. And he said, our, our real concern is you're announcing that you're going to do a different episode, the first episode from Friends for this performance. You did a different one for the first one that you did. That implies that you're going to go through our whole series, which is indeed copyright infringement. And I said, you know, it doesn't make any difference to me what episode I do. So I went back and did the same one that we did before. And I told them I wasn't taking anything off my website, we're gonna do this. And they, they sent me a nasty letter, sort of cease and desist kind of thing, but they eventually didn't do anything about it. Um, but I really like the fact that this kind of fed into the culture in a really curious way, that the producers of the show knew about it, likely the actors, uh, I'm sure the Quake uh, game uh, producers knew about it and that it had this idea, just this idea of performing in this kind of space had gotten out there into the cultural zeitgeist. Um, that's very seductive, but also really a really interesting way to, to disseminate the content, uh, one's content as an artist. Um, I've, I've also, I should mention that I, I tend, tend to switch back and forth between kind of gaming virtual experiences and kind of real world installation projects. This is a piece called First TV Memory from 2003. Um, when I was about f uh, four years old, uh, when uh, Kennedy was assassinated in uh, Los Angeles, I remember getting up in San Francisco and wanting to go out and watch uh, Captain Kangaroo on TV that morning. And I remember my mom had the TV on and it was preempted by uh, events surrounding his assassination. And what it was that I later came to realize was basically there was an image, there was a camera on the back of the train, uh, of the funeral train heading to Washington for him to be buried. And that image just was seared in my mind because I was so angry that I couldn't watch Captain Kangaroo. So anyway, this is a piece to kind of recreate that. And it's a motorized Ferris wheel with uh, HO scale railway built on the inside and a little um, uh, spy video camera pointed at it and so I gave this impression of this memory that I have. Um, and again, it's a kind of reenactment um, and, and a process of, of using memory to kind of inform uh, what one makes as an artist. 
um, I evolved this concept to a larger piece called East of Fallon Highway 50, Nevada. And if you've ever been on Highway 50 in Nevada, this is, uh, it's called the loneliest highway in America. And uh, having driven down it at night in a snowstorm and driven it down at night otherwise, it's a really lonely experience. And so I wanted to recreate that. Um, sure. So I built a about a seven and a half foot tall Ferris wheel type structure with a carefully modeled road bed on the inside of this wheel. And uh, there's two flashlight bulbs that act like headlights and a camera. But this is not just a spy camera, it's actually a network uh, server camera. So it feeds a live image projected on the wall that gives you the impression of driving in a car. It was really great because people come in the gallery and they thought it was a DVD, like it was a recording. It was fairly convincing. And then you notice uh, the space much darker than it appears in the video. You would pretty much just see the light and the camera um, on this surface. Um, but this, this was also a mixed reality project in that it, this image was being fed live to my website. Uh, so you could come to my website any time that the museum was open. This was at the Nevada Museum of Art. Um, you click on this icon and you could actually experience online that image in, uh, in, in real time. You'll see it in just a second here. So again, it's this kind of reenactment, this sort of memory, and this kind of ironic, kind of uh, almost useless use of the internet to project this image that was really kind of boring. Um, but connections to uh, the notion of the internet as the uh, information superhighway, all that kind of things are certainly there as well. Um, the next reenactment project that I went into was uh, I reenacted all three of the presidential debates in 2004 between George Bush and John Kerry. And I kind of stepping into politics in a way uh, where, where, where I remain at this time. Um, first one was done in Battlefield, Vietnam. And this was when there was a controversy over George Bush and John Kerry's Vietnam service or lack thereof um, for our, uh, George Bush, et cetera. And this was a new first person shooter. I was so surprised that they were making a shooter game about Vietnam. I never thought that they would get to the contemporary and they certainly have at this point in time. Uh, the second one was done in Star Wars Jedi Knight 2, Jedi Outcast. And with uh, John Kerry and George Bush as, uh, as kind of Star Wars lightsaber enthusiasts having duels with each other. Um, and, and they weren't fighting, it was all text, but people would certainly come and attack them and kill them. And, um, I would go from one character to the other throughout the course of the debate. Each of these took about eight hours of typing. Um, and, uh, and again, a type of public service of sort of putting this uh, supposedly important political dialogue into this kind of canned environment where you always know what's going to happen and, and there's nothing quite, you know, the, 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 these games are very predictable. Um, they're, they're this process of kind of doing the same thing over and over again. And oftentimes the political debates seem like that as well. Um, the third one, though, was a revelation. Um, this was in The Sims Online, and this was my first foray into uh, these uh, massively multiplayer online role-playing games, right, where there are thousands of people in a given game space kind of interacting and, and not killing each other, per se, in general, but uh, living. Uh, and this is this was really a strange experience because I, of course, when I do these, I, I go in with as a kind of performative space. It's, it's like Marina upstairs, she won't talk to anyone. I'm just doing what I'm doing, right? It's like I just sit there and I type and people talk to me and I ignore them, I just keep typing. In this space, I could not do that. I mean, the people were, were, were engaging me so much that I eventually broke character for the first time in one of these performances to the extent that both George Bush and John Kerry were invited to marry residents of The Sims, which I did. Uh, and then went back to the debate. Um, but it was also really, really curious because people were engaging me politically like with questions and you know, this one on the bottom right that was the Republican headquarters, one somebody's particular territory. And they were just really, really, they did not like Kerry at all. Um, and, and George Bush writing the mechanical bull, which seemed sort of appropriate. Um, um, back to an installation project that I was working on this became a much more transitional project than I uh, kind of uh, 
expected. I was working on this project for about two years, and this was kind of taking that Ferris wheel uh, Highway 50 project to another level with four cameras with a switcher box that would randomly switch between these cameras. What I was working on were kind of mechanized dioramas, very realistic, of uh, made from photographs from uh, the Iraq conflict. And I, I, I have these skills from when I was a kid. I, I was a pretty much a master model builder and could make very realistic miniatures. And so I was creating these sets. It was going to be like a 24-hour a day uh, documentation, doc, doc, documentary that would be on the internet. So you would come to it and you would see this image and it would always seem to be changing because of these random edits between the cameras. And I was working on this project for quite some time and had a uh, disastrous flood at our home in Reno where my studio was in the basement and uh, basically my entire studio filled up like a swimming pool to the, to the ceiling. Lost all my equipment, all this project, all my slides. This was really a incredibly taxing experience for uh, myself and my family. Um, but it was also this major turning point in my work. And uh, sometimes, you know, the world kind of sends you messages. <laughs> um, but this was one of those times. And, and basically all I had with me, we were in San Francisco visiting uh, our family. When this happened, all I had with me was my laptop. and an idea for a project that I had put on hold while I was finishing this that I then went into with full vigor. Um, America's Army, uh, Dead in Iraq, uh, started this in 2006. And this project came about from, there's two projects I'm gonna talk about that came about from uh, experiencing and kind of considering this website, which is the World Trade Center site uh, memorial competition project, which in uh, January 2004 was published online. And it's fantastic, actually. I mean, they put all 5,201 proposals on this website that you could go look at. And I, and I really like the kind of aspect of kind of using the internet to share this information with the public. But yet at the same time, I was really, you know, the, the Iraq war was about a year into itself at that point, And there were many thousands of civilian casualties. Our uh, soldiers' casualties were growing um, increasingly. And I remember speculating to myself and really thinking about, okay, what's going to be the Mile End Memorial for all the soldiers who end up dying in this war? And even more so, perhaps, thinking about, wow, they, they, there would never be an official process like this to memorialize all the civilian casualties who were dying in Iraq in ever greater numbers at that time. Both those notions kind of stuck in my head and, and gave birth to these ideas at the same time. I'm going to talk about the America's Army Project first which specifically addresses American military casualties. Um, the America's Army Game, if you're not aware of it, is an extremely popular, free, government-funded uh, recruiting and marketing tool uh, created by the Defense Department. Um, and it's, uh, it's freely downloadable uh, to anyone 13 and over. They've, they've made it with a level of violence such that you don't need parental permissions. Uh, it's like a direct line into uh, kids' computers. and. Um, I was really, I had been aware of this game for some time and always sort of thinking about, okay, there's, you know, I wasn't, th th this is a serious game. I mean, and, and I, I, I wasn't sure how to quite engage it. And when I considered the 9-11 memorial and the issues of the war, just somewhere that notion of going into this game, uh, dropping my weapon, and proceeding to type in doing a roll call of the names of all the soldiers who died in the war, that's what this is. And so I, since 2006, I have been doing this and going through the entire list, um, typing in the names. And it's this sort of silent visual. Um, I do, you will see on the video, there is some sound to it. I, I use a text-to-speech uh, function in the game, so it does read it back to me. But this information is basically, um, kind of a, a, a record keeping of the progress of the game and you can type questions and, and uh, kind of respond to each other verbally through the keyboard. Um, here you'll see, watch the video and it'll make more sense. So here you see I, I appear with my squad. We're waiting for the match to start. 
And each of these players is from anywhere in the United States, abroad. Um, this is internationally a very popular game. You see, I just dropped my weapon. And I usually move over to a spot where I just have kind of a point of view. And you'll see on the top left there, I start typing in the name of a soldier, a real soldier who has died in the, in the conflict. Ricardo Exwell Rue, West 23 Army, October 4, 2000. So I get killed. I keep typing. And I hover over my dead avatar and keep typing until the match ends. This is actually edited, this footage, um, but this is just, again, a sort of repeated kind of cyclical process of, uh, of birth, death, and this kind of vigil. Um, and, and I look at this, I've considered this project from the start as being a memorial and a protest. Um, it, it, it is that roll call, it is that listing of names that you see on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. However, it is done in a space that is actually part of the entire situation. Um, and let me explain that a bit. Um, one of the things that started happening when I did this, I started doing this quietly and I didn't announce it as an art project, I, didn't, I just started doing it and I was actually quite uncomfortable in a way thinking of this as an art project. Um, but I've, I've, I've come to accept that and actually celebrate that at this point in time. Um, but what would happen is, you know, this, this would start, this started to get out there on the blogs and uh, it started, uh, someone wrote about it on salon.com, wired.com. Uh, it began to get out there in a very big way. And I started engaging in kind of discussions with people replying to these stories on the blogs and people were really pissed off. You know, who is this asshole? I'm gonna go break his legs and da da da. And, this is not the place to protest. This is a game. Why don't you go? Why don't you go to the steps of the federal building? And my response back was, "This is the federal building. This is government property. This space, this virtual space, that is a game to essentially encourage young people to perhaps sign up, go somewhere, and land up killing others, perhaps being killed or mortally wounded, or post-traumatic stress. It is part of that reality." And what I'm doing by going into this space is essentially closing a loop. Uh, you can think about that there are names that I have typed into this of the 4,000 plus names that I have typed into this game of people who started their military experience by engaging this simulated uh, warfare, right? And that, that just, I, that really is deeply problematic. Um, also the fact that it is a taxpayer funded uh, um, system and as a citizen as a taxpayer this is where I need to do this this is where one needs to call attention to the reality that is going on uh, as opposed to the fantasy that is represented here as being the war um, there's also something in, in computer gaming kind of theoretical circles and and the people who make games talk about the magic circle as this kind of space it's almost like the suspension of disbelief with film but it's a bit different because you're in this kind of space. Think of this as sort of piercing that magic circle with reality. Um, and uh, it's, it's been really pretty amazing to see this get out there. And I've been interviewed on CNN, NPR. Um, it's the idea of this as a protest, as a memorial, has gotten out there in a very interesting way. Um, and it's, I don't know, I mean, I, whether this has had any effect, I mean, I do know some, some people have contacted me about experiencing this and being deeply moved in terms of how they're thinking about what this means and what the war is. I've actually had uh, young students, gamers, one in uh, uh, Santa Cruz, this was being shown at a gallery, um, the video, and a young man actually ran from the gallery in tears and the gallery director followed him out and asked him what, what was wrong and he says, I play these games all the time. I never thought that about anything of these having to do with the war. I'll never play these again. He was totally freaked out. Um, and that's, you know, I think it's a good thing. I want, I want to get inside their heads. Um, and I think there's, I have some deeply personal reasons for that. Maybe I can talk about that some in the question and answer time. Um, 
I have performed this live. Uh, this is in Newcastle, UK, while I was there on sabbatical. Um, I was very reticent about doing this. I didn't want it to be a spectacle. But it, uh, these landed up being really intense uh, experiences, both for myself and the audiences. Uh, you know, this is kind of like a world where a certain segment of population kind of lives and spends a lot of time. And, and I think when people get exposed to what is going, what these spaces are truly like, um, it's, it's a bit of a revelation. Um, other projects related to this. Uh, when I was in New, New York in uh, 2008, in spring, I was awarded a residency at Ivy for six months, which is fantastic. I'll talk about the work I made there in a minute. But I met Steve Lambert and I met uh, some of the Yes Men and, and got peripherally involved in this fantastic project, with them, which I'm sure you're all aware of, the Fake New York Times Project, all the news we hope to print. Um, fantastic utopian left-wing edition of the New York Times uh, that, you know, you know, National Health Insurance Act passes, uh, education fully funded. It's really amazing. You can see this online, actually. It's still on there. But I proposed an article to them about the popular America's Army video game recruiting tool canceled. And in its place, a new game was being created with all the funding was being transferred to the State Department for the America's Diplomat game. And I have this, this fake homepage online for the game. And it's a direct mirror effect of the America's Army game. So I took the site and basically redesigned it for uh, diplomatic purposes. And this was, you know, this was fun, but it was serious. It's, it's again asking that question: Why do we spend millions of dollars on this, but we don't have this, right? Why is our emphasis always on this? Always, you know, it's our, our, it's it's questioning, and it's and it's kind of intervening in a way that hopefully people stumble across this. And kind of fascinating to read the blog comments on this because there's a lot of people saying, "Wow, where can I get that game?" You know, that, that is, that's that's encouraging, you know. Um, so uh, another uh, sort of related to this project, um, there's a huge merchandising culture surrounding the America's Army game. One of them is, is these action figures of real American heroes, and of course the real American heroes who haven't died. Um, so I've, I've done something with uh, some of these action figures. I actually bought a set of them, and I reconfigured them to create uh, part of that reality. Uh, and essentially is a literal kind of reassembly and using my modeling skills to create a different kind of action figure. Um, and curiously, I, when I was, I was finding a, uh, I was looking for slides for a presentation and you see all these representations and there's mine showing up on Google. So that, and that's kind of, that's interesting. That's sort of a, a different kind of intervention just by the nature of the search engines. Um, so, Another project that I've been deeply involved with from this time, uh, IraqiMemorial.org. Uh, started this in 2007, and again, the, um, the World Trade Center site memorial competition. Um, fascinating, you go through and you look and you see all of these proposals. My idea was essentially to create a website that would do this, but for artists to propose imagined memorials to the civilian casualties in Iraq. I could, uh, I could have very easily gone the direction of the New York Times project, kind of copied it and just sort of made a kind of comment in that. But I decided I wanted it to be its own thing. The inspiration may have come from this, but it has become its own project. And just some figures. We don't know for sure how many civilians have died in Iraq. And it, it, is, it, is, a, it is an issue that is little discussed in the popular media. Um, it, it's, it actually is quite disturbing how often you read things in everything from the New York Times to the Wall Street Journal where they'll talk about our loss in blood and treasure and oh not to mention them you know sometimes they'll mention the civilians but it's it's we, we you know it's we're so focused on ourselves in this country that it's it's rather uh, disgusting and so these are just some 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 uh, numbers that are out there and um, I've read the Lancet study it's quite fascinating and um, you know, you can take this for what it is, but it's it's pretty amazing the disparity in terms of the loss of life uh, that has come out of this conflict. Um, so RacketMemorial.org exists as a website, and artists are invited to submit proposals uh, for the creation of memorials. 
And almost from the start, curiously, I thought artists would all make proposals. And what happened was many artists started uploading works that they had done or they were working on. And so there's about a third of the projects on here are actual projects that artists have done, have created. And the website features artists from all over the world, mostly from the United States, but this is a, an Iraqi expat artist, Rashad Salim, and his kite project, um, Matt Kenyon, a fascinating project where he has created yellow pads and the lines for the yellow pads actually are microtype names of Iraqi civilians who have died and he has surreptitiously uh, managed to get these pads into the office supplies used by the Congress, um, which is a fascinating project. Um, to uh, other projects, you can look at this online. There's 180 or so proposals on there right now. Um, really fascinating works. And um, the project itself uh, is evolving. Uh, we have the first physical exhibition of this project at the Shepherd Garrett University of Nevada, Reno, just came down uh, this past Friday. Um, but this is another iteration of the project. And, and we've had two jurors reviews. There's no winners to the project. I've invited jurors to rate their top 10 proposals for two years running. And all those proposals that were uh, recognized by the juries have been featured in this exhibition. Um, working on traveling this exhibition right now, we have about five or six galleries um, interested in showing this project. Please talk to me if you're interested in doing that. Um, but real important, I don't, and I'm not going to talk too much more about this project. There's a lot of information on the website, but I see the I see the virtual presence of that gallery online as a memorial in and of itself. This collective uh, kind of uh, database of memorial proposals um, as being a memorial. That's that's my part of the project. Uh, but it's like creating this forum for artists to then come and express these ideas. Uh, it gets about ten thousand uh, visits a month. Uh, on the web uh, and is ongoing. And uh, it is still open to proposals, so if you want to create a proposal to submit some work, please do, uh, as this project will hopefully keep growing. We're also, I'm also working on a book project uh, with a number of scholars involved in art, war, and terrorism. We'll be writing for it. And uh, I, my, my ultimate goal with this project is to eventually uh, see this exhibited in Baghdad, and I'm working on some uh, initial steps towards hopefully making that happen. Um, so working on these two projects, on primarily on my sabbatical and, and leading into my sabbatical, uh, they're very intense. Being attacked online, um, getting in these, di just it's, and dealing with the, both these projects, dealing with the subject of death and dying, um, and, and constantly being challenged by people about the nature, specifically the America's Army game, of, of, of that as being a valid form of protest. And I began to do some research and reading about the nature of the history of protest. And of course, when you start researching protest in the 20th century, all roads land up leaning back to Gandhi. And so I learned much more about him uh, reading his autobiography and other texts. I became fascinated by how, how he managed to deal with very dark subject matter and very difficult uh, life experiences and, and keeping a sense of humor, a sense of the joy of life, and kind of being able to kind of uh, sort of turn things around in a way. I, I was finding myself in a very dark place with those projects. And I had an idea for a performance sometime before this of, as opposed to sort of a chat-based performance in computer games, what about a walk in computer games, like, like a pilgrimage of some sort? And reading about Gandhi and, and getting reacquainted with his history, of course, the Salt March to Dandi is, is a seminal event in his life and a transformed, uh, really kind of looked at historically as a very significant uh, kind of shift uh, towards leading towards uh, the independence of India from Great Britain. Uh, but reading about it, I was like, ah, oh, that, that it just sort of all came together. So I proposed to I-Beam to reenact Gandhi's Salt March in Second Life. And I was awarded this residency, and so I set out to create this project. And somewhere along the way, one of my ex-students who was living in New York at the time, Eric Burke, a fantastic guy, I mentioned this project to him, and he says, why don't you do it on a treadmill? And I was like, oh, you know, kind of perfect. Yeah, great, I'll do that. And so I started researching it, and this is a treadmill desk that you can actually get for $6,000 from Steelcase. 
and this is a $163 Nordic track walk fit treadmill that I bought off of eBay and eventually converted to create this system to allow me to actually physically walk the salt march reenactment. And it was very important to get this kind of treadmill because this is a self-powered treadmill. All treadmills today have uh, power that make them walk, which seems kind of ridiculous on some basic level, but that's another lecture maybe. Um, so, but this, so this one you actually have to push, and you, you, and, and you'll see it in the in the video that comes up here in a moment. Um, but I designed it really simple to essentially translate my physical steps into Gandhi's physical steps. And you'll see him walk here in a moment. Um, and so, I looked at this project in part as a kind of tribute to durational performance art, which I was very aware of, and a lot of it had having happened in New York City, and as well as kind of actual experiential reenactment of this historical event. And so I did this on the actual anniversary dates of the march. I took rest days when Gandhi took rest days with his followers, and I walked over 26 days the 240 miles of the march in Second Life, essentially averaging about 10 miles a day um, in Second Life and on the treadmill. And uh, I went into this as this, from this kind of, I always do this with my project, you always go in with this kind of conceptual stance as an artist, like, okay, this is gonna be exploring durational performance art. Um, it'll be this kind of virtual experience. And it was amazing as I hadn't spent a whole lot of time in Second Life prior to this, and I found myself completely absorbed in the experience and I think it was more so because of the physical action required to explore this space. You know, when you think about a space like Second Life, and I, I kind of jumped into this really quickly here, but Second Life is this, this uh, online community uh, where there's anywhere between 40 and 70,000 uh, residents online at any given time, right? And, it's, and, it's, and I, chose this, I chose Second Life because it is this big, free, continuous space. There's roughly the land space, I think, of Singapore in Second Life. Uh, if you were to match them up. So there's enough room to walk, and it, there were enough uh, residents there, avatars that I could kind of try to find followers and, and reenact this march. So I did, but what, what I found out doing this was that I just became so attached to Gandhi, but also to the experience. This, you know, When you're going into these virtual communities and things, you're pressing the arrow key, and you're walking, and you're moving around, and you're kind of having, you're sitting on your butt, and you're doing this thing. It was fascinating to think that I was probably the only person actually physically having to earn that next experience of space, you know? And in Second Life, also the main ways of, of transporting yourself are to teleport or fly. And I, I did not allow myself to do that. I set rules. So I was walking everywhere. And it was incredible. I mean, I would walk towards that little map up on the right. That's kind of your local map. And those little green dots are other residents. And I would essentially sort of navigate towards people. And, in, and you know, say hello, tell them what I was doing, ask them how they were doing. And it was just the most amazing, most joyful experience. And I found myself being deeply transformed uh, as, uh, as an individual. I, I, I lost eight pounds. Um, I struggled for about the first week and then I got into it. Then it was like this daily thing. I, you know, I walked, I ate. I slept, I, I ate, I, I walked, I slept, you know, it just was, and I found myself completely getting absorbed into this headspace of Second Life to the point where I would be walking to the subways in New York and thinking I could click on someone to find out information about them, you know, or walking down the stairs and having some kind of deja vu, and vice versa. When I was on the treadmill, a lot of times walking around these territories, I'd be going over mountains and Gandhi would like stumble off of a cliff and I'd almost fall off the treadmill, you know? It was like, and it just, it, it really, I don't know, it was, you know, people were amazingly friendly. Uh, I would give people a, a, a copy of my walking stick and invite them to join me, and so I had people walking with me every day. Uh, this is a stop action that I recorded. It's basically a, a screenshot taken every minute of the march. So this is the entire march encapsulated into about uh, 17 minutes, and I can't remember the frame rate here. That's fairly quick, but you get a you get a sense of both the expanse of Second Life and the crashing and the coming back into it, and um, it was really really quite an amazing uh, experience. That 
is a bit difficult to even kind of express in, in this context. Uh, more experiences, uh, experiencing virtual Gitmo, which was really kind of important in terms of feeding into the next work. There's a guy who, when I walked up, suddenly morphed into Richard Nixon giving the Chuckers speech. Um, Dragon's uh, Star Trek training class that I walked into up on the top right, They're learning how to be Trekkies in Second Life. Um, a couple of uh, people, uh, residents from India, who walked with me quite a bit. Um, Top left is Princeton University's island. Um, and the final day had a whole group of avatars kind of invited all kinds, all these people who had walked with me to join me on this final day of marching. And uh, this is at the uh, reproduction of the monument that's actually at Dandi in India, um, where we landed up at the end of the march. But actually, this is, this, these, this is the final steps of the march, actually, which curiously was right on this wonderful uh, spit of land looking out onto the water, so it was really kind of uh, kind of cool. Um, and reenacting the photograph, famous photograph of Gandhi actually making salt, which curiously in my research discovered that the photograph on the left is actually a reenactment similar to MacArthur coming back to the Philippines because they didn't have a proper photograph, so they went to a different beach and restaged it. Um, unfortunately, the reenactment picture I made on the left I, I don't generally show because my uh, my assistant at iBeam actually made the animation so that he's picking up the salt with his left hand, which he's of course not doing, and that's not something you would do in India anyway because of what the left hand is used for. So I'm probably going to reenact this reenactment um, just for that purpose. Um, but again, I had this really powerful connection to my avatar by the end of this. And along the way, I'm thinking, gosh, I really need to do something with this. Um, so I worked with some technology that iBeam had developed, another uh, fellow who was there to extract my 3D data of Gandhi from Second Life and I first created uh, two a rapid prototype uh, 3D prints of my avatar and you can see the one on the right being, made, being created there and later painted white and on display and this one is about 13 inches with gold leaf uh, and this is on display in uh, Guangzhou, China. Um, but I wanted to make a big Gandhi. I had this, this. I had a show at the end of my residency in the space at, at Ibeam, which is this enormous um, warehouse. So I was like, okay, I want to make him big. How can I do that? And I started. I, I came across, across this program called Tepakura, which is a papercraft uh, uh, shareware program from Japan, and usually used to make little figures of anime characters and that sort of thing. Well, I adapted it to use cardboard uh, to create an enormous Gandhi. And here I am, and this is six weeks of the end of my residency at IBEAM producing this piece. No idea whether it was going to work. I basically had to sort of invent the engineering process to get this actually to function at this scale. Um, and it was an amazing physical feat putting this whole thing together. And, and in a way, kind of a durational act of construction similar to the durational nature of the walk itself. And in the end, I had a 17-foot cardboard uh, copy of my Gandhi avatar, and I made him the same height as Michelangelo David, as I thought that would be a, an appropriate kind of uh, reference for him uh, to art history and such. Um, was displayed with the original treadmill and that video of the stop action that I showed just briefly. Um, but this has become really curious. Um, about the end of my residency, I was invited uh, uh, by the curators of the uh, Guangzhou Triennial at the Guangdong Museum of Art in uh, uh, August of 2008 to show Gandhi. And I said, great, I built him in pieces. He's being shipped back to me from I-Beam. We can send him out. And they said, no, 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 we want you to build another one. And I was just kind of like, you know, you've got to be kidding. But I, I, you know, I went with it. I was like, okay, this is cool. They, they wanted kind of a local flavor, kind of workers. And so I went there for two weeks and worked with them um, and we created the second version of this piece and had a different sort of character was really again really amazing um, was shown in probably the best space in the museum and this triangle had about 770 artists showed screenshots showed the little sculptures but he just really commanded this space in a very interesting way in the beautiful black chandeliers by uh, I can't remember the artist's name, but they were now friends, really great guy. Um, 
with and people would be photographed with him. They just it, it was uh, really really quite intense. Um, a curator who saw Gandhi there, Bart de Beer from uh, the MUCA in Antwerp, saw him and invited me to do a third Gandhi in Belgium uh, this last spring. And again, I was kind of like, you know, okay. Um, but really excited too. And I, and I can't, this is part of that connection. I, I could never think in a million years that I would be repeating a piece that I built. Like all those pieces I showed you, I, it's like they, I, you move on, they're done. But I'm like, really, this, I really have gotten into this. And, and it's an interesting, it's like going to these places. This one I worked with students at the Art Academy there. It's a beautiful exhibition, this all that is solid melts into air. Wonderful context. And built him with these students, and he's in the atrium of the Art Academy, which was part of this whole festival of art. It was just really, really wonderful. Um, and, and this, and all of these builds have been these like intense physical experiences. Like just, you know, I got there, they started working on it for two weeks while I was not there. And then I came on spring break, actually it was a year ago. And of course, everything that could go wrong went wrong, trying to do this long distance build. So it took like 10 days up to the opening of just 12 hour days getting this to come together. And at the end it was just, you know, it was beautiful. Um, Finally, this, this third version was accepted to be shown at ISAIAH, the International Symposium on Electronic Art in Belfast this last summer. And, and they transported, uh, actually one of the curators from Mechelen actually drove him over in a truck in pieces and we reinstalled him in the atrium of the University of Belfast, uh, of Ulster, I'm sorry. And he just, I mean, a really great space. He just commanded this big atrium with natural light. Um, but one of the wonderful things of this one is he was um, he was destroyed at the end of this show. He was he had been installed for I think that show in Mechelen was about four months, and he was the weight was starting to get him architecturally, and he really looked great in Belfast. But at the end of it, I said, okay, he needs to be recycled. I don't want him going to the dump. Can you guys take him down? I don't want you taking pictures of him falling over. And it just like I want him to be you know just kind of uh, disappear in a way. It was really great because one of the guys who was working on the project was involved in guerrilla gardening in Belfast. And he said, oh, I'll make sure that, that some of the cardboard gets into compost heaps for this guerrilla gardening project. And that was fantastic. That's just perfect. So um, the second Gandhi, by the way, the one in China, they actually um, acquired for the collection in, uh, in China, which is really great. Um, just uh, kind of continuing these threads of these projects, um, this was a piece that I created for a wonderful exhibition cur curated by uh, Yale Amir, who's actually here tonight, that was at the EFA Gallery this last spring, and I created a, a smaller life-size paper craft of my America's Army avatar uh, out of paper and projecting the video of the game intervention. This sculpture is actually covered, the entire body is covered with the names of all the soldiers on the list. Um, I then went on this last summer to build a giant version of this avatar out of cardboard in Beijing for the Beijing Biennale um, in an exhibition curated by Raul Zamudio called uh, The Man Who Fell to Earth. And I think Raul may be here tonight, I'm not sure. Um, but this was, again, one of these intense two-week builds working with these three students, none of whom spoke English. And so it's, you know, this kind of silent build and pointing and directing and uh, we eventually finished this figure which has shown the, the, the small uh, America's Army figures on this pedestal and the videos being shown in the background there. Um, and finally, the last piece I'm going to talk about, um, Gandhi went back into Second Life. He had, uh, when he left Second Life, people were like, where's Gandhi? We miss Gandhi. Bring Gandhi back. And I tried bringing him back a couple times, but without the treadmill, I, I felt naked, like it was there was something wrong. and. Uh, uh, Chinese artist uh, Kao Fei actually invited uh, me. He, she saw the Gandhi statue in Guangzhou where she lived and said, she's got this R&B project. Would Gandhi like to do something in R&B city? And I, and I said, well, I'm really uncomfortable having Gandhi walk around as a typical avatar. But in fact, a month after Gandhi uh, finished the salt march, he was put in jail by the British for nine months. What if we reenacted his prison sentence? So he would go from this wandering pilgrimage to being confined to a space. 
Well, I, I never quite heard back regarding that proposal, and I suspect maybe the politics of it might have been uh, a bit touchy. But um, so I, I decided to do it on my own, and eventually was invited into Odyssey Art and Performance Island to actually reenact this nine-month uh, durational uh, recreation of Gandhi's prison sentence. Um, about a month into this, I had the idea of well. Gandhi needs to do something more than just sit and kind of interact with folks. And it was about the time that uh, the Obama administration was making uh, pronouncements of moving on from the issue of torture and all these kind of things and moving on, move on. Also, the torture memos had been published by then. And I decided, hmm, maybe it'd be interesting if Gandhi were to actually read these torture memos as a performance in Second Life. And so I began on the 4th of July spent the whole day typing into the local chat as a performance from the torture memos. But then I, I, I was like, wow, this is actually kind of interesting. And people were really engaged and kind of fascinated to see this text going into the chat. I worked out a process for translating this beyond Second Life. And you'll see that here. So here you see Gandhi typing away. And you see that little bird up in the left corner. It's a, it's, a, it's a free program in Second Life called Twitter Box. And essentially, it allows you to send your chats from Second Life to your Twitter account. So there you see Gandhi doing that and sending them off to Twitter. And then it's very simple to set up your Twitter account to feed directly into your Facebook account. So basically, I spent every day for the last seven months of this reenactment daily reading a page at least from the torture memos into local chat that then went to my Twitter account and then went to my Facebook account. And this is just another way of kind of bridging these various virtual territories, right? And sort of moving from one hyper-reality space to another. And something as well, I think, significant about you know going from a game space to this more sort of social media environment that was really important and then kind of interrupting this kind of chit chat on Facebook with some very, very serious uh, language. Um, it's also very droll as well, kind of curiously. But, um, but of course, time came for Gandhi to be released from prison. And some an avatar came and said, what are you going to do when Gandhi gets out of jail? And I joked, he's going to sing Freebird. And I actually kind of like that. So result is this event, which is the GG Hoop Nanny, Gandhi's Global Gaming Sing-Along. And right now what you're seeing is the performance group Second Front actually surprised me. I knew they were going to do something, but I wasn't sure what. And so they're breaking Gandhi out of jail, of course, on the day that he's going to be released anyway, but they acted like they didn't know that. Um, and uh, actually, BB's here, who's in, in Second Front. That's her in her little beret with her big old gun there. Um, so they blow him out of jail. And that's his guard up there getting ready to perform. Um, and you'll see Gandhi emerge from his cell in a moment here. But this was, again, this sort of way of creating this sort of joyful, kind of ridiculous event. The concept was really kind of a way of sort of reenacting kind of Live Aid or Do They Know It's Christmas or these kind of celebrity uh, concerts for various costs. And so I invited people to come as famous avatars and join me. Like there's Sarah Palin, there's, you know, you have uh, Charlie Chaplin's here, I think. Um, and then I had five one-hour performance sessions. That's a lead singer from The Cure walking around there. Um, I had five one-hour performances where we actually and this was really an experiment as well using voice instead of chat, voice chat. All these, Second Life now has voice chat enabled. And um, what I proposed was we were going to have a concert. All these celebrity avatars would come. Uh, there's the Pope with Gandhi. And there's, um, what's the guy's name from The Cure? Smith? What, what's his first name? Ready? Thank you. Um, but so. We performed songs of freedom and protest uh, the entire day and scheduled events. And, and there were, it was also streamed live on the internet so people could watch it. Um, but, you know, SpongeBob showed up, uh, Hello Kitty, 
Um, but here's one, and there's many more avatars there that are behind the camera. So these are residents from all over the world singing through their microphones, and the timing is entirely off because it's all you know, different lag points. Nothing you can say, you can learn, 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 learn. It's easy. And it was, the, the documentation really it does not do it justice. Uh, you had Prince Charles, um, you had uh, Chickalina on the left there, actually rezzing in the background as Andy Warhol was playing the drums. Uh, you know, Wonder Woman, Darth Vader showed up. Uh, and this is a, a, a performance group in Second Life that came to perform uh, the Metaverse, not forgetting the Metaverse Orchestra. Again, inviting everyone to sing along. All we are saying. That's the last thing I did in Second Life, and um, it was fabulous. And it was, again, this day-long event. I was totally exhausted. I set up in the computer lab at the university and had students and other guests come singing. And what's really strange is that when you're doing this, when you're using voice chat and you're singing on an open microphone, you can't have your monitors coming back because you get this loop, this crazy kind of loop. So I, I couldn't hear any of this until the next day when I watch the videos and, and I'm still editing these down and I plan on putting out a CD kind of compilation of all these songs that we did because uh, it was really this interesting voice experiment music virtual space kind of uh, concert um, in an area that I'm interested in moving into as well further but uh, anyway that's it for the sort of formal stuff and I probably talked way too long but uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions talk about anything you like, but thank you very much. So um, maybe I'll start, and I know there'll be a lot of people with questions because it's it's fascinating work. So to do the book, what's the book going to be on Gandhi or uh, the the book we're planning on is basically a catalog and a kind of scholarly uh, consideration of the Iraqi Memorial Project. So it will be very much a, a balance between being a catalog and an academic text. So this other work, because it's so um, engaged with Second Life and the performative side, and so it's like, how do you document, share? It's on your website. Um, yeah, I mean, I got, I have tons of stuff online, and of course, I think like any artist these days, my website is a mess. <laughs> but um, you can find documentation, most all this stuff online on on my site, and I, I've got a blog for the Salt March project that actually I kept a daily kind of journal of the experience and it goes backwards in time, right? So if you start at the last post, you can actually go through the entire march and my thoughts and comments and there's pictures um, and videos on YouTube. Uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of all over the place, but you can definitely find find the work on there. And then it's actually, I think that's kind of an important, really important aspect of distributing the work and, and, and particularly being an artist living in Reno, Nevada, where, you know, it's kind of, how does the work get out there? And I think a lot of this came from, in some ways, my geographical location. So it's nice, this um, metaphor that gets used of this bubble. Mm -hmm. So we have communities. Um, we're here in a group, and there are many friends here. Um, we have face meets, and then 
off here in um, Nevada. Um, so we talk about Twitter and YouTube as social media. Um, so it, here we are in MoMA, and we're dealing with performance, as we all know. Melina is upstairs during the day doing these amazing um, reenactments. But um, so what's my question? <laughs> so it's like it's very interesting. Yeah. So it's like um, where where are we going? <laughs> where are you going? <laughs> um, yeah, good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think you can see, I, I hope that throughout the work there's kind of a, there, there's an attempt to sort of push the envelope in, in all of these kind of environments. In a, in a, and I, I, I like the, I mean, that it's mostly been text-based. It's mostly just been like going in and simply kind of putting in this text information that is something that probably doesn't necessarily belong, and that's why it tends to sort of stand out. But it, I, it, it's a way of, in a way, like in the, in the shooter games, it's like essentially really kind of questioning the very nature of those spaces and those interactions. Because you are interacting with other folks in those environments, you're just running around shooting, you know? And so it's, it's a way of sort of like saying, wait, like wait, what, you know, what, what is, why, why is this prescribed activity? Why is that the only thing that needs to happen? So it's kind of, in all of these spaces, it's a way of kind of uh, exploring what is possible or maybe pointing towards other possible narratives that you might be able to put in those environments. And, and really important, I think, to think about, from, from the get-go, I think I forgot to mention this, but thinking about like Howl or any of these spaces, of thinking about these game spaces as being a new type of public space, right? That if, if you're an artist and you're, create, you're trying to work and contact people, it's like taking your work to where they are seems important. And so it, it's, it's a way of kind of exploiting and questioning those environments at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then here we are in a museum where um, we've got paintings on the wall. Um, we know the whole conservation of paintings, as problematic as it might be. And then we've got video and film, and we've figured out a lot of that. So here you are pushing, and artists who are here too are pushing the envelope of what is a work of art? Well, and the, the documentation of this stuff is so difficult. I mean, that's something that I've really kind of struggled with. <laughs> and I, it, my, I mean, like that that hoot nanny. And there's several people who were here, and, and, and it, it's amazing. It was it was really fantastic because I can't tell you how many people afterwards who were there like said, "Wow, that was the most amazing experience I've ever had in Second Life." And it was, it was kind of, they were like a happening. It was like something you really had to be there. Mm -hmm. And to document that effectively mm -hmm. is, is nearly impossible. Um, and so that, that's something that, you know, it is, there is something about just the experience of being there is significant. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I did forget to mention, um, at the end of that event, uh, Gandhi retired. So he, he literally, it was great. <laughs> the the video is not so good because it was a little bit choppy, but I had this, he basically walked off into the sunset. And he's retired, so that's that's kind of cool. So Stephanie's here. Um, when we do the questions, please use the microphone because we are recording. And great. So yes, but take the microphone. Uh, I just wanted to know how many miles is uh, Second Life? It. it, it what, what I've read recently was, it, as far as if you took all the space and, and kind of smushed it together, it would be the same geographical space as Singapore. But as far as the distance, I, I, I couldn't tell you. Maybe some of the other Second Life people who are here might know. But um, it's fairly large. Um, and series of islands, mostly rectangular islands, or I'm sorry, uh, square island kind of in this vast sort of ocean space. And, and if uh, can somebody like search for you and come to see you from the, at the other end of uh, and, yeah and that's when when good. when Gandhi was in there yeah they, they could definitely um, but but it, it's kind of that that's a that's a difficult question because you have to like you have to know exactly someone's avatar name in order to put it in the search to get and it will tell you if that person's online and you can communicate with them or teleport you know and things so it is possible to find people 
it doesn't give you list of possible names with that similar avatar name or does it? It, it can see mine was the only, mine's the only m gandhi there's actually a, a number of gandhis in there but mine is the only m gandhi so i found some people would find other gandhis but not my not my gandhi and they're usually just the name you know is there is there an architecture department in reno no there's not unlv actually has a very good architecture program Thanks, Joseph, for compelling uh, lecture. And uh, you're using the, the, the social network and internet as a, a virtual platform for engagement. And the question I have, what is the role of the gallery or the museum in your work? That's and how, rele how relevant <laughs> is the physical space? I, I, that's, you know, I, that's a really important question because I... I <laughs> It's really kind of funny because the, like I will see the, um, the impact. It, let's put it this way. My ability as an artist at this point, I mean, I have had some fairly significant museum shows with these biennials and that sort of thing, but the, there's something really amazing about the reach and the possibility of the internet in terms of actually getting information out there. Um, like, I mean, perfect example, we just had the Iraqi Memorial Exhibition, and it, it's a fantastic exhibition. It's our, it's our gallery at the University of Nevada. Maybe 750 people came through the gallery over the course of the show, you know? 10,000 people come to the website in a month, but yet the exhibition was really important. There was something about seeing all those in the physical space, and I think over time, that getting out there will be really, really significant. But I mean, like with this other work, you know, the making of the big statues and that, I mean, those are physical objects that land up kind of perhaps feeding into those kind of environments. But um, I don't know. I mean, there, there is there is definitely something about functioning as an artist in Reno and in a, in a way kind of being off the map of the art world that has really sort of propels one to think otherwise. And so it's not been my arena, really. I mean, I have, I've had lots of shows, you know, here and there, but I, I'm, almost, um, I'm almost more satisfied with the results of how I've been able to get ideas and work out there using the internet as opposed to using galleries and museums. You know, that's, 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 a, that's a curious, really curious situation. Never expected that to happen, you know? Um, but that, that is how it is. So, um, Juan, and then we'll take a question in the back. Yeah, uh, Wafa says, uh, what is the role of the gallery in the museum? My question is, what is the need for the art gallery in the museum? Well, I think again, you know, it's like the, the Iraqi Memorial Show was really important in that context. I mean, I. I, I knew that it would be different than the website because the website has very much an individual experience of proposals. You know, it's like one artist comes up, you go to the next, another artist. And to see it in this collective space and the artist reconfigured all their proposals into that, it's, it's actually a really moving, intense show. And, and, but as far as like the other work, I mean, I, you know, I, there is, I, I'm, a builder I make things I make stuff I have you know this is this is part of what I do and I feel it's one of the reasons I seem to shift back and forth and one, one of the things that I really loved about the Gandhi project was that I was able to bring those two worlds together from the you know the virtual performance and this kind of installation sculptural space and I, I'm sure I'll be doing more of that as things go so my my last part of the question is what is the relationship to isolation Loneliness, solitude. Well, this new, new yeah, new world. Yeah. I don't know. That that's. Uh, I mean, that was something you know with the with the Gandhi in jail thing. It's like uh, you know, I literally went from this sort of free wandering of this space to that's where I can find my second life experience for nine months. You know, I was with him on average between you know two, three, four hours a day, and oftentimes because I have a job, like I would have my. I'd be teaching a class with my laptop connected, showing something, and I'd have the other computer, the Second Life, and there's Gandhi. So I'm still, you know, that 
So there definitely was this kind of isolation to that experience. And many, many days where maybe one or two people might come by at the most and other days where there would be like a whole class from a university coming to visit with me. And yeah, it was fascinating. I mean, it was really, but, but there is something about, you know, there's definitely something about isolation in, in terms of, of working working in this internet sort of setting. You know, you're, you're still kind of a sole actor largely in this space. Um, but it is it has been this way for me as an artist to kind of reach out and start forming these other communities and, and um, engaging in a way that you know, is is quite quite nice. There's someone in the back. Oh, over there. Yeah. Hey, um, I think isn't there legislation against the military marketing towards youths? And that's something that current concerns me when I go to movies and I see advertisements from the National Guard and also America, America's Army. And I wondered if you had done any research on that and if you know anything about the problem of marketing towards uh, youths in that way. I haven't heard of any legislation or anything like that. I'd be really curious if, if there was. It's not like it's up for vote. I think it's, you know, it's a, the, the military is supposedly prevented from marketing towards uh, People under 18, under the age of 18, so they can't. For it's it's certainly not the reality. I mean, the the way the game has been designed, specifically with a very low level of bloodshed, allows for this kind of a free download for teenagers without parental permissions. Um, and and you look at like the America's Army experience. The uh, those they, they travel around and they have a big one uh, on the East Coast where you basically can go climb inside of. Uh, motorized Humvees with your buddies shooting machine guns and all of that. Um, it, it's, you know, they're oriented towards high school students. So it's, I mean, it's definitely their focus. And, and you got to hand it to them. They're brilliant in terms of coming up with this because the, the games are kind of under the radar, I think, of most parents. They know they play games, but yeah, they're playing computer games. And, you know, you know, and this is <laughs> very seductive. Um, I mean, I couldn't imagine what it would have been like when I was that age to be confronted with something like that. Um, they're, they're really engaging on a basic kind of addictive level. Three questions. You mentioned that um, you had become an activist artist partially out of some deep personal reasons. I wonder if you could expound on that. Oh, sure. Um, well, the um, the America's Army Project in particular was, um, I, I, you know, I sat on that idea for about two years before I started doing it. And it wasn't, it wasn't just because I was involved in that other, that other project that got destroyed, but it was certainly part of it. Um, I really wanted to, be certain of my motivations and what the piece was about and what I was trying to accomplish. And I came to a point of, of kind of recalling, um, you know, when, when, when I was growing up, and my mother can attest to this, I was totally uh, headed towards going into the Army when I got out of high school. Um, I had actually um, gotten to the point of meeting with a recruiter at our house in San Francisco, and the next step was to actually sign up. Uh, go down and take the test and they send you to wherever you know whatever area that they think you're you're appropriate for and uh, what happened was this recruiter came to the house sat with me and chatted a bit and he was a Vietnam vet and at one point he says you know I I probably shouldn't be saying this but you know the the military it may not be for you it may, you, you might you know it's, it's not for everybody it's not all it's cracked up to be and I really shouldn't be telling you this and 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 it was one of those things that's like, you know, you have this idea of what things are like and where, you, where you're going in your life. And it was one of those moments where, like, this guy came along and I'm going like this and he just went boom and I went off in this other direction, right? You know, and a few months later in an art class at the Catholic school I was enrolled in in San Francisco, I was the best student in the class and I asked the teacher, gosh, do you, you, know, do you think I could be an artist? And she said, yes, Joseph, I think you could. And it was another one of those, like, boom, going off in this 
where I am now. And so I, I look at I look at this work as like an opportunity for me maybe to do that once in a while to these kids you know, or whoever's in there to just kind of uh, you you go into when you when you're in these games it's a bit like watching television you know you zone out on a basic level it is interactive but you you know you you finish it and you don't remember it you know it's it's kind of like gone from your mind and my hope is is that when I'm just putting this text information into that space that it breaks that like someone comes out of that they they might be really pissed off at me but they're thinking about it right it's it there there's a consciousness of this kind of connection between what's really going on in the world and what's going on on, on someone's computer um, but this these steps towards being an activist in my work have been really really curious I mean I, I've always been interested in politics and I've always perhaps been a little bit suspicious about art being somehow engaged in that but it, 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 there's just these steps and 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 I can tell you what really sort of probably solidified my thinking on on this project in particular um, about a month and a half into it I was contacted by the brother of a soldier who had died and a very respectful email and he said you know my brother was killed in Iraq he was you know he believed in what he was doing uh, he played the game uh, but he he would not want to see his name being used in this way could you please not include his name in your roll call and it was one of those like you know it, it really sort of stopped me in my tracks and I went back and I looked through the list and I had already put his brother's name in and I only do them once I go I'm going through it and but it really it really pushed me to a place where I had to respond to him and, and I I sent him like a two-page email that really I had to get down to brass tacks about where I was coming from with him and uh, and I think that experience probably more than anything kind of really kind of pushed me to a place where I where I became more comfortable with my stance and, and what it was about and kind of claiming it as both this kind of activist political gesture and something creative and, and artwork uh, and, and what I told him essentially was that my concern with what has happened in regard to how we are considering the deaths of soldiers in the war is that you know we weren't seeing the coffins we weren't allowed to see pictures of dead soldiers as we were in Vietnam it was all being censored and very much sanitized for us but even more so was that the mourning was considered to be entirely the responsibility of the families and it was always in respect of the families that they were doing what they were doing regarding this issue and I basically told me I said look I said you know going through this list even sitting down and reading it I mean it's a you know you print it out it's like a big old stack of names right just sit down and read that go through that list and if you're not crying by the second page I mean it, it you know it was such an emotional experience of doing this and retyping it and going into this space that I, I told him it was like this this is a way of me in a way kind of claiming some responsibility some 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 kind of culpability in this situation because we are all responsible for what has happened you know I mean we're all paying for it we're all you know it, it is not something in it and that it's not just up to the families to be the ones more mourning this or taking note of it and so um, and actually curiously he and I, he and I were interviewed on uh, NPR in, in a kind of dialogue with each other that was actually quite intense and I think you can still get that online if I remembering correctly it should be linked to my website um, but so but he landed up being very respectful of where I was coming from still disagreeing with what I was doing but it, it was in some ways a really hopeful thing of being able to have this dialogue you know with it, 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 from very opposing positions which is something you don't see much of today but um, anyway so that that was definitely something that kind of pushed me in that direction so we'll do Ed and then Marcin. Ed's and there's okay. a question over there. Yeah, and Marcin. Thank you. Uh, quick two-part question. I don't remember who it is, but somebody has been recreating famous performances in some virtual place, uh, performances that probably shouldn't be redone in real life, kind of like Marina's show, Chris Burden's being shot. Mm -hmm. Do you know about that work? Uh, Eva and Franco, yeah. They might be here. 
Scott, Scott Kildall. I mean, there's actually not there. There are a number of reenactments of performance Scott works. Kildall. Yeah, um, yeah. That that's definitely stuff that's happening. So, in thinking through that, what do you think might be the significance of somebody reenacting one of your Second Life performances? That's what they would be. So, like reenacting Gandhi's right. walk. That would be wonderful. I don't know. <laughs> that would be very, very strange. But um, I mean, actually, there's there is there there is kind of a curious. Um, there was an experience that sort of hinted at that in Second Life. I don't know if you saw this. There was one slide where there were like these little like tiger-looking creatures, um, and they I think they were from Sweden, and somebody amongst them I, I think had basically an application that's a, a copy bot, and you essentially. All of a sudden, they went from being this little tiger thing to being uh, not quite right Gandhi, looking at me, you know, sort of thing. And I'm kind of like, you know, like, what? you know. So I, that's 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 fine. I don't I don't mind that at all. It's kind of a curious thing to think about. So, Mark Winters. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the Facebook part of the. Performers, because that's the one that I personally <laughs> got to see a lot. Cool. And uh, you know, when you when you go to to a military game or if you go to Second Life, you expect crazy things to happen. But if you're on Facebook, it's a little different, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I I felt that it was kind of very subversive in the in that environment in a very different way, you know, because of course you can block somebody's feed. Yeah. Well, you can't do it on, on iPhone. But um, basically, at some point, I started reading this stuff, you know, and I started just sort of going with it, and it was it was kind of it was kind of very strange, and I don't know what I think about it. I kind of have like a love hate thing with that performance. I think it was maybe the first performance that took place in Facebook that I know of, so that was that was really interesting. What was the feedback, you know, from um, that environment? The feedback was was quite minimal. I mean, I think that what I, I, I know that I lost a number of friends. Um, and, and actually, curiously, I, I, I've heard peripherally like an, an artist friend who I actually talked about beforehand with this uh, eventually uh, tweeted or, or Facebooked a, a message saying, oh, God, this is just awful. You know, like, and, you know, that, and so I'm not sure. I mean, I'm still assessing it myself. Um, I do get a sense that I think a lot of people have probably blocked my feeds because I, I know from before that project when I would put a comment about something that's going on, you know, what, you know, the typical Facebook sort of message, I would get a lot of sort of likes and things, and now I get maybe a few. So I know I know that a lot of people are probably still blocking me, um, but you know that's yeah, it's 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 an experiment, and I, I'm still assessing it myself, so I'm I'm not sure. But the, the, the basic, I mean, one of the basic reasons for doing that was um, considering the question, right? When you go to Facebook, I mean, what, what's it say? What are you doing now? Or what, what, what's on your mind? Or what, you know, I'm just being honest. You know, I mean, this is, this is what's on my mind. This is what, you know, so it, it I, was at, I was simply answering that question uh, when, it, when it comes down to it. But um, yeah, I'm still, I'm still processing what that, Project was all I, I thought it was really interesting. Like, oh, thank you. That was cool. Sorry, what I talked about earlier, the game is actually designed not to have the blood, not to have the gore. You know, your leg doesn't get blown off. There's not blood splattering on the wall, that sort of thing. Um, but what I would say, what, what became interesting, you know, because I'm, I'm really not redefining the nature of the game itself. It's more the, what happens in it. Uh, but I do find really interesting the screenshots because they become these kind of a sort of poor virtual uh, representations of the images that we're not seeing coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan, right? I mean, I remember growing up during the Vietnam War and seeing Life magazine and the pictures and the, you know, the news, you know, you would see images of, of dead and wounded American soldiers. Very, very rare do you see them from this conflict. And so these, in a way, are kind of poor uh, kind of representations of that. You know, so when you see the, the it, it's probably the only place you can actually see 
a fallen American soldier is inside this kid. And so it's like a way of kind of making that sort of, uh, that kind of facsimile, that kind of fake of that experience. But yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So one last, okay. First of all, thank you so much for this presentation. I am totally fascinated by the work you do. And um, I guess my question is that the most interesting aspect for me of the work that you do is this reconceptualization of virtual spaces as a new public sphere, like you said yourself. And uh, you do this, I mean, by taking these spaces very seriously and introducing like, noise in the system, as it were, like introducing political messages mm -hmm. where they are not expected at all. Uh, on the other hand, it seems to me that by doing that, you seem to be entrenched in these practices even more. Practices which, which could be very dehumanizing on some level, and I'm just wondering if this is something that you feel ambiguous about, or if you just don't recognize the ambiguity, if you think about this or not. You mean as far as like the, the, the basic sense of being in these spaces as being kind of dehumanized, or the actions I, that I'm doing? I guess it's, it's, it's my own prejudice, you know, that this kind of, um, this kind of spaces, I mean, don't foster like interpersonal communication. Yeah, you know, yeah, they yeah. Right. They, ha they they hinder it. I mean, at some level, you know. And uh, when you have someone like spending hours I mean, behind a computer, and that's the only way they have I mean, to communicate with other yeah, people, yeah. you know, then I think I could be seen as problematic. And uh, even though you challenge that by joining the games and like sending these messages, yeah. you're yeah. entrenching yeah, you know, yeah. like, the practice yeah. even more. You know, so can you comment on that? Yeah, yeah, I, that, I I'm very much uh, I, I'm very much walking some thin line. And you know, as I mentioned at the as I mentioned at the start of this, when you know, I, I really didn't like computers. I still don't particularly like computers. You know, it's like the I, I'm I'm somewhere probably between uh, you know, the, there's a luddite side of me and a kind of really sort of fascinated by like more sort of going towards like Sherry Turkle writing about how people's lives on the screen. That's a very really great book that there are there is something about these communities about there's something that can be very transformative on a human level from these experiences but I'm also really there's also a side of me that's like this is really dirty like there's not but you know I mean I, and I, I always I bring this up to my students all the time like you're, you're going in these spaces engaging and making these communities and these friends like in Second Life it's very much this you know, it, it, it's, I, I call it, you know, Facebook's with the, the arms, legs, and a head. You know, you're kind of connecting and making friends and all that. But yet we don't talk to our neighbors, right? You know, we don't, you know, communities, real communities are, are vanished, you know? So, I mean, they're, they're, I, I think it's definitely part of my thinking on it. And I, um, you know, there's really, those, those are very difficult questions, but I think that's part of, engaging in this stuff is trying to figure out that very question you're, you're asking you know it's like what what is it but you do you do end up propagating it like your question at the same time as you're critiquing it in a way so yeah I don't, I don't know if that answers your question but it's definitely something that I that I really am conflicted about um, however I will say that I mean that's one of the things that I that I found quite humbling to the Luddite side of me was how much I got into that Gandhi project and being in that environment for a solid month. You know, that was, there was really something, there's a lot of really nice, wonderful people or how they represent themselves. In, and, and I think striving for a sense of community, a sense of belonging, that there's something very positive about that while at the same time there's something you're touching on something that our sort of darker side of that. Um, um, I'm starting to. I met one tonight. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that's. I mean, that's been that's been actually really. You know, like with the Gandhi in jail thing, I I became uh, very good friends online with the members of Second Front, and I knew one of them. I think Scott killed all beforehand, and I met another one before now I'm you know I just s spent several days with another one out in Reno so yeah you do start making these connections but the, but that's something I've been doing as a media artist in general just because the whole community is kind of based in this kind of hyperspace in a way oh we've got more 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 I don't mind <laughs> I mean it's you're, I mean, you're, it's 
Since we're running late, um, one of you? Preston, is where is this where activism is going in this virtual environment? I mean, that's you know, I think y yes and no. I mean, the the you know, I started this the the America's Army project um, not too long after um, Cindy Sheehan started her vigil, you know, at, at uh, George Bush's ranch and things. So I think there's still definitely a place for physical protest, but it but it's also you know, if you look at the protests that happened with the Iraq War, they were oftentimes misrepresented or, or underrepresented in the media, I think, because it's sort of old school, you know, marching and things. So, I, you know, there, there's definitely some, there's something about being able to exploit the new media to get a message across that is definitely, definitely important, I think, to, to take very seriously. And the yes men do it brilliantly, you know. Um, so, I mean, I... I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm again. I oftentimes find myself sort of on this borderland of like, I even it took me a while to even sort of consider myself being an activist artist. But I think there's definitely evidence there that that's what I'm doing. You know, so it's yeah. I, I, I think it's yeah. I, well, you know, and w will it become old hat? I'm sure it'll probably be the next thing. But to get, you know, to get the kind of to get the kind of notice to some particular issue you could sort of have to take it to where it's living in a way and that's that's just and, and it's where I live you know it's where I function as an artist is in this stuff so it's for me it makes sense definitely what's next <laughs> oh um well um a couple things um briefly I mean I'm really interested in I'm really intrigued with the singing and that was like a real, I mean, and I'm actually thinking of forming like a, a FPS choir, first person shooter choir, ah! you know, like imagining, but actually getting like real singers in some kind of context, which could be kind of interesting. Um, I want to make, um, I want to make some more giant Papakura sculptures and, and I, I'm picturing, uh, I'm actually really fascinated by the depictions of the other, the enemy in these game spaces. Um, one of the things I didn't mention about the America's Army that's really important to recognize, it's really pussy, is that when you when you go into an America's Army battle, you you are always to your teammate, your American soldier, right? But to the enemy, they see themselves they see themselves as Americans and they see you as terrorists. So there's always there's like this jujitsu kind of, so you you see them as terrorists, but they see each other as Americans. So everyone who plays the game gets to be a good guy, but the good guys are all bad guys, right? So there's this weird, and so what I what I want to do is actually take some of these stereotypical um, militia terrorist kind of figures, and I'd like to do I, I, I'm picturing basically like a giant uh, terrorist with an AK-47 out of some kind of black cardboard material or something, and then maybe uh, a partner that would be a, an American soldier, perhaps in white, or maybe it's black, or maybe, I, I haven't quite figured that out yet, but I, that's something I'd like to see. Um, and finally, um, there's kind of a long story behind this idea, but um, we have a lot of time, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, the, uh, so the, why don't I, I'll end on this, because this is actually a good story. Um, when I was about 14 years old, um, we had a family friend who was uh, an upholsterer in San Francisco. And it was my first job going to work for this guy. Great guy, really fun. Um, and his main business was, part of his business was replacing theater seats, right? So I would cut out these patterns hours at a time. And he was a, he was a, a a 1970s Super 8 pornography connoisseur, right? And so, and he was very much into the nascent pornography culture in San Francisco. And 
One day I go to work, and here I'm this Catholic schoolboy, 13, 14, something like that. And he says, we're going to go, we got this job, and he was, um, he was redoing the interior of the Mitchell Brothers Theater in San Francisco, which is the O'Farrell Theater. And the Mitchell Brothers are like the very famous San Francisco pornography brothers they did behind the green door. I mean, they kind of started a lot of what is typical today. And anyway, so I'm like, wow, gonna get to check this place out. So we go down to this porno theater, and we go in, and I'm sorely disappointed because there's there's not a picture on the wall. There's nothing. It's just basically everything red fabric, you know. And but I did, I, you know, my my boss was he was painting the floor in one space, and there was really nothing for me to do. So I started wandering around, and I I went into the um, the peep show where they had like the pillbox turntable where the models would sit, and then they had the the booths around it surrounding it where you put the you know, the basic thumbs up, and then you put your money, and it goes back down. But it was all empty, but everything was red. I just remember red and kind of sticky floors, and really kind of gross. Um, but what was fascinating, and where the story is going, is is the manager at one point took us into the theater space, which was smaller than this, uh, red chairs, and there was a, a, a catwalk going out into the space, and that was like where the performers would come do the striptease and all that. And he says. He says, oh, but what most people don't realize is the, you see that white curtain at the back of the stage? That's leftovers from Christo's running fans, right? <laughs> and I just was like, and I remember, I remember, you know, I was growing up in San Francisco and we used to go to Boy Scout camp and we'd drive on the freeway and it came to both sides. I remember the whole process of the controversy and, you know, and so I remembered that piece. And this was one of those like pivotal moments in life of, kind of irony, like, wow, you know, this connection between real life, contemporary art, and sort of, so, and that, and that, that stuck with me, like, you know, that, that I'm sure it has affected all this sort of cyclical nature of my work and the kind of recycling materials and all that, but I've wanted to do something with this, and I'm not sure what it would be, and I've had this idea recently, which I'm not even sure if this will be even possible, but my, my sense is, to imagine, imagine. I mean, what, with with the running fence, I, I was always taught, you know, taught this, read about it. How it was like an iceberg. Like the piece was up here, but the work he did below it in terms of communicating with communities and uh, ranchers, and you know, to make this happen. So my idea is essentially to go on this uh, this quest to approach game companies and you know, Linden Labs, whoever. Like imagine like a day where various maps across game spaces would feature a part of Christo's running fence, right? Like imagine a, a, a map in in, uh, in World of Warcraft or in Second Life or in you know any of the many thousands of shooter games out there, and this being a kind of virtual recreation of the running fence as a sort of temporary. It's like imagine those public spaces featuring public art and. Whether I can make this happen or not, you know, I'd have to approach Christo and I'd have to you know, go through all these processes, but that's definitely something I'm thinking. Um, and there's other things too, but I'm kind of out of time. <laughs> so on that, we'll close. Thank you very much, Joseph. Thank you.